Hello and uh, welcome to CSGB at Home. My name is Andrew Patrick. I'm the Director of Political Communications at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. I um, want to thank you guys for joining us. Today we are uh, very lucky to be speaking with a uh, community uh, organizer, uh, campaign strategist, issues advocate uh, for uh, the Community Justice Action Fund, C CGAF, Greg Jackson, and our policy analyst at CSGV and our sister organization, the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, uh, Ari Davis. Uh, thank you guys uh, for making the time. Awesome, thanks for having us. Appreciate this. So, <laughs> Greg, um, last week we saw these two horrible anniversaries, the one year anniversary uh, of Ahmaud Arbery in um, Georgia. And then uh, last Friday, um, the um, Trayvon Martin anniversary, nine years uh, since his death. And that kind of pushed this idea of stand your ground into the mindset of many Americans, uh, because it was a law that a lot of people didn't know existed. The NRA introduced it in Florida as kind of a guinea pig state, and it kind of uh, has grown from there. So as it, with what CJS does, uh, the this law has been used, we know, kind of in a racist way to as a license to kill black and brown Americans. Uh, your group has done a lot of work with Stand Your Ground. Uh, you have a campaign, This Is Our Ground. Uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about that campaign. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I mean, I think you kind of you kind of teed it up well. I mean, coming off of these anniversaries, Unfortunately, it took um, people seeing these deaths on camera firsthand to really acknowledge um, that laws like this disproportionately impact um, black and brown communities. Um, if anything, it's used as, a, as an excuse to justify um, killing the black communities. And there's been so many examples um, of how these laws have been leveraged in this way. Um, the Ahmaud Arbery uh, murder hit me really hard because I'm, I'm an avid jogger, you know, and I watched it and I just, I saw myself, you know, in that. And I think, unfortunately, in the Black community, we see ourselves in all these different situations and cases. Uh, with Trayvon Martin, you know, I, I used to walk to the corner store and, and get some Skittles and candies when I was at my grandpa's house, you know, and, um, and hey, I might not dress like everybody else, or I might look cool, or it might be cold. And I have, I'm wearing a hoodie right now, you yeah. know, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I'm a threat and that I'm someone that's, that's worth being slain um, while walking from the store. And then, and uh, unfortunately, that has been normalized because of these laws and because of the culture of racism and, and frankly, uh, uh, the institutions that white supremacy has really built in our country. Um, and so um, when we think about what staying your ground means um, and why it's so detrimental, even beyond its disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, in the 28 states where they've passed some type of staying your ground laws, they've seen um, increases in homicide um, and firearm related harm. Um, and so while it's being framed and messaged as something that helps and saves lives, statistically, it's, it's cost us so many more lives. And these are not just the, the justified cases that you think uh, this law would protect folks from or save folks from. It just, it just welcomes the use of lethal action into any conflict without any uh, requirement to retreat, especially um, in public space. And so, um, you know, we are, we are adamantly against these types of laws. Um, you know, if you're a gun owner and you're trying to protect your home, that's very different than someone who's, who, who doesn't retreat uh, when they interact with someone in a public place like Ahmaud Arbery on the highway. I mean, I'm sorry, on the side street as he was jogging. He was, he was um, practically chased. He chased. Was, he was hunted in, in a way. Uh, and it was a, uh, yeah, and, I, and it took 74 days and a video in order to even start to take, have justice in that. Um, even the yeah, and I mean, our, our campaign is really just focused on how do we fight back on these laws and, and really try to reframe uh, how we talk about keeping our homes safe. You know, I think the narrative around keeping our homes and our family and our own person safe has been uh, corrupted um, by the gun lobby and the gun industry. Um, and they're literally profiting off of our fear and unfortunately costing us lives. So um, that's a little bit about what This Is Our Ground is about. So how does that campaign uh, intersect with the other policy objectives that CJF's doing uh, to, to promote equity and justice? Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is we recognize that there's so little that has been done around gun violence and reducing gun violence. And the first thing is that we're just racing to push forward um, policy priorities that can urgently make a difference now. 
right? Number one, if we start to invest in survivor support programs and strategies that focus on those who are most at risk, that's part of our invest in us um, campaign. And that we know that will save lives today. Um, we know that laws like stand your ground, um, even some of the uh, extensive uh, castle doctrine laws um, and the lack of hate crime laws in certain states. If we make changes in those policy, we can save lives now. Um, and then thirdly, a huge priority for us is how do we really lean in on uh, resources and laws to support uh, or defend against gender-based violence? Because that's something that, like so many other forms of violence, is heavily dependent on law enforcement, um, which frankly doesn't work in our communities because of that break down in trust and relationship between individuals and law enforcement. So how do we um, produce and push forward and advocate for solutions to reduce gender-based violence um, in our country and in our communities as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's great work. Uh, we partnered some in Ohio and some other uh, efforts. Uh, I know we're a part of the Invest in Us campaign. Um, Ari, uh, you had uh, took the lead on uh, the report that we're releasing this week uh, on Stand Your Ground, CSGB Educational Fund report. Um, what are some of the top line findings, and and what did you what stood out to you in, in your research through this? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no, I think so. The report um, that CSGB is releasing really summarizes the um, provides an overview of all the research um, looking at Stand Your Ground laws um, and looking at the different states that have them. And then also providing some narratives of, of the tragedies that standard ground laws have, have led to. I think the big finding um, that, that I discovered while I was doing this research is really that not only does standard ground laws lead to you know, specific circumstances that are absolutely tragic, but it also just create, it creates a culture, um, a, a shoe purchase culture, um, and it, it emboldens uh, individuals who already. Um, may be racist or have or, or just be have a have predisposition to, to, to violence to to act more violently so there's been um two studies that that looked kind of nationally at the um you know 20 25 states at the time that had um stand your ground laws and they found that those the stand your ground laws were associated with um about an eight percent increase in, in homicides in those states so that that translates to to 600 homicides every single year um, that are linked to this kind of shoot first culture. I mean, when you pair standard ground laws with um, really lax open carry laws, it just creates this um, environment um, where a, a dispute can can quickly escalate to um, to, to violence. Um, and then the other thing to to, to and, and Greg hit on this really well is that it really um, is it emboldens white supremacists and racists, and it also is disproportionately protecting. Um, used to, 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 to justify the killing of, with white men killing um, black individuals. Um, and when uh, uh, a black individual tries to use uh, standard ground, those same protections aren't, uh, aren't there. Um, and that's also true with, with women as well. So it's kind of this double standard that just reinforces um, the racist uh, structures within our criminal justice system. Um, so I think that that's, very apparent through the research. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are, those are kind of the top line findings. I mean, I think one thing that was interesting, a lot of the research looks at Florida um, because it was this kind of model state that, uh, that unfortunately a lot of states, um, you know, after Florida passed, the majority of states now have stand your ground laws. Um, but in Florida, they looked at the cases where um, stand your ground was successfully invoked. Um, and you know, in 70% of the cases, the individual who, who was killed was unarmed, right? Um, and in one in three of the cases, um, the person who uh, invoked stand your ground as a defense had a history of illegally carrying a gun or threatening people with a gun before they used stand your ground as their defense. So it, again, it just emboldens this kind of uh, vigilantism and, 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 and aggression that, that can just escalate conflicts. Um, and disproportionately harm uh, black and brown individuals. Yeah, thank you. Um, Greg, I mentioned that we uh, we were part of the Ohio coalition. We worked very hard to stop that. Unfortunately, it got passed and uh, was signed into law by the governor there. We just saw Arkansas send theirs to the governor to be signed. Uh, where do you see the cultural trajectory uh, of these laws? And, and what are you hearing from communities on the ground with all the work you do 
uh, the, the groups and the community groups who are trying to stop them. I'm sorry, Fran, one more time. I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, so, like we're seeing these laws continue to pass in states. Uh, they're spreading to making these anti-mob laws where you can define who is a looter and uh, pretty much puts judge, jury, and executioner all in the hands of citizens who have abused this law, like Laura was talking about. So where is the cultural trajectory going with them? And, and, and what are you hearing from the communities you work with on the ground, uh, people who are trying to stop these laws? Um, what's, what are the concerns that you're hearing and uh, coming away with? You know, the, the most alarming concern that I hear is folks are afraid. And frankly, they are trying to figure out how do they protect themselves um, because they, they're losing faith that the government is enforcing and implementing laws that can keep them safe. And so we're seeing a flip side of this whole dynamic where more folks are arming themselves in their homes, folks who don't want to be gun owners, people who don't want to have to do that. Um, but feel required to do that, to protect themselves. You know, um, I had someone say, well, do I need to jog with the firearm now? It's like, what? You know, what world are we trying to jog with firearms because we feel that unsafe in recreational fitness activities, right? And that, but that level of fear is real, you know? And so, um, unfortunately, we're seeing um, that fear kind of fester in, in communities. And a lot of the leaders who our huge advocates for, for safety in their communities are also now becoming um, advocates uh, to have firearms in response to, to government failing them. Um, you know, one of my friends, I'll never forget, we went to the movies and she pulled up, this was last year, and I'm sorry, we were going to dinner because it was during COVID. And she said, I want to show you something. I'm a little nervous and opened her trunk and had a, a gun in it. I was like, what? And this is someone who's probably, I don't think she's ever gotten in a fight. One of the most soft-spoken nicest you know conflict diverse people ever but she's just like i just feel like i need it in these times you know and um unfortunately that is that is becoming a real narrative and so um, i'm not sure how we quite combat it i mean we've got to dismantle these laws but then there also needs to be some real um focus on um gun safety and gun storage um and that's something that is culturally inclusive and not just focused on suburban homes and parents and fathers and mothers but also is focused on um, inner city communities as well. And I know that's been overlooked um, since the beginning of, of the gun responsibility conversation. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, Ari, what would you like the American people, uh, communities across the country to know about these laws that they might not? So I think um, there's this perception that uh, gun carrying in, in, in public and, and stand your ground laws will, you know, reduce crime and deter crime. And, and that's been a narrative pushed by the NRA. Um, and it's just false. I mean, there is no evidence that these laws, whether it's stand your ground or whether it's, you know, public carry, um, these laws increase violence and they do not deter any types of crime. And so I think, you know, we're looking today and, and, you know, I think this, this session, this year, there's already been, um, you know, over a dozen states that have introduced stand your ground laws. And we've known for the last decade that these laws lead to, to, to increased violence. Um, and so I would just ask folks to, to look at the, look at the research, look at the data and, and really kind of question that, that assumption that, um, you know, gun carrying in, in, in public is going to um, make you safer because it doesn't. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the other thing is, and, and, and Andrew, you alluded to it, I mean, the, the, the recent uh, policies that have been introduced or, or um, floated uh, in a number of states that are called, you know, so-called like anti-looting or anti-riot laws are really dangerous expansion of what is already dangerous, right? So they expand stand your ground laws to allow um, people who perceive someone else as looting to, they, they allow those people to have to shoot the looters. Um, and I think that that is just like blatantly racist and it's a blatant response to um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I think we need to um, be very clear that, that those types of laws that are proposed by, you know, including even the governor, of, uh, Governor DeSantis in, in, in Florida, 
um, we need to we need to really oppose those laws and, and call them out for what for what it is, which is just racist laws that that yeah, that they are. So. And just ask ourselves, like, what does that say that someone who loots and till, steals a TV deserves to die? You know, I mean, just let's assume it's all let's just assume all the rhetoric is correct. Someone comes in and takes a TV and that their life is worth less than that TV. Um, that's not a policy that we we implement in our suburbs and in, in our you know, shopping malls, you know, we, we don't even chase people out of a shopping mall when they walk out of Old Navy <laughs> or Best Buy. But yeah, with these types of laws, we're trying to encourage that type of reaction. Um, and it's more about harming certain types of people, not about the value of what's being lost and what's been taken. And that, 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 uh, that narrative is dangerous. And that's how, that's what led to situations like George Floyd, where we're calling police officers in to deal with a $20 dispute, you know, um, and so I just I just think that we, we've got to figure out a way to to, turn, to reverse a lot of this thinking um, if we truly care about saving lives. And so we need to press our elected officials out to 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 speak out about that and to really if if that's if they really think that that TV is worth more than someone's life, I want them to say that so we can put it on our next campaign commercial and vote their butts out of there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like just to give a person the ability to define what looting is or define what uh, and, and then take action in their own hands it's just like you said incredibly dangerous and irresponsible um i want to thank you guys both uh for taking the time uh this is an important discussion um ari the report is coming out on wednesday and uh greg uh, i want to thank you so much it's called uh, this is our ground campaign and uh cjf's doing amazing work and uh, i want to thank you so much and keep it up and uh Hope you guys, uh, please take care. Thank you, Andrew. And, and thank you, everybody. And y'all are doing amazing work. I'm going to try to retweet it. I probably won't be the most famous person to retweet <laughs> you guys. Because y'all are a big deal. Yeah. Um, thank you again. It's a great resource. Thanks, guys. <laughs>